Talking about the built-in data types, you might be curious, why does the tuple type even exist in the first place? It's like a worse list, isn't it? Like the list gives me everything I need. Why did they come up with tuple? You know, with the list, I have a list here and I can modify the list, I can iterate over it, I can even unpack a list if I want. That's a completely valid thing to do. I can do everything I could do with the tuple. The tuple basically is like the list, except with one or two minor exceptions, there's nothing it can do that the list can't do. I can't assign to it. So there's plenty of things that a list can do that the tuple can't do. This tuple type does not seem very useful. And you may have all seen something like this where, you know, when you try and assign to a tuple, it can sometimes tell you that the assignment failed, even if the assignment succeeded. If, for example, you're not assigning by changing the contents of the tuple, but you're mutating a mutable type that exists within the tuple. So here, what you would see if I didn't have this try except is this line would claim to have failed, but actually succeeds. And so, you know, this tuple type, I don't get it. Why does it exist? Now, guaranteed, there are things you can do with the tuple type that you cannot do with the list type. For example, you can use it as the keys of a dictionary. Why would you want to do that in the first place? Well, think about this. You have some dictionary, some mapping that maps between entities and some corresponding values. Experiments and the experimental results. You know, entities you're managing and some configuration data for those entities or some process or some steps you want to do for those entities. Users and their parameters, their settings, their configuration items. And you could model it in either of these two ways. You could model it as the entities just encoded as a string or you could model as the entities encoded as a tuple. Note, there is an in-band encoding here where one entity ends and the next one begins may be difficult to disambiguate if the entities can also have commas in their names. Is this three entities, A, B, C, and D, E, F? Or is it two entities, A, B, C, and D, E, F? And without some sort of partitioning or some additional metadata, some external metadata, or some sort of escaping, we may not be able to tell the difference. Whereas here, it is clear this is actually three entities. From a practical perspective, one thing that we might think is, do we look at the keys of a dictionary and we understand the data that's stored within those keys? Do we ever destructure that data? So ABC comma DEF, is that just an opaque entity to us and we never take that apart and say, oh, tell me all the different components of this? If not, then maybe the first formulation is perfectly fine. If so, then definitely we want the second formulation because in the second formulation, we could do something like for the X and the Y portion of the keys here, look at those separately and tell me what those two pieces of data are. And maybe, you know, compute the Cartesian product of ABCDEF and ABCDEF XYZ and look at all the different ways that these might appear. There is another possibility for what we might put in this dictionary, which is a frozen set. And in the frozen set scenario, we want the structured data that's stored within that key. We want to be able to dismantle that structure, but we want to do that in a way which is no longer order dependent. In this example, in the first example, the value for ABCDEF doesn't have to be the same as the value for DEFABC. Whereas in the later example, because the frozen set isn't an order type, isn't a, sorry, a human order type, it's a machine order type, and where that ordering is not considered in the cases of the hash or the equality, these two would be the same. Let me give you a scenario where this might occur. What if this is a mapping between components or between devices and steps you need to perform on the device? Or maybe, what if this is a mapping between users and what groups those users belong to? Is the group that ABC and DEF belong to the same as the group that DEF and ABC belong to? Yeah, there's no ordering there. That's why you might want to use a frozen set. Why you might want to use the tuple is there's maybe some sort of sequence or there's some particular ordering that's necessary. And so, in the case of ABC and DEF, maybe ABC represents the manager and DEF represents the subordinate. And so, the group where ABC is the manager for the project and the DEF is the person who's working on the project is definitely different than the one where DEF is the manager for the project and ABC is the one who's working on the project. And so, you can see we have these choices. So maybe the tuple has some life to it. Maybe there's some reason to use it as the keys of a dictionary. But here's what I want to share with you. A tuple is meaningfully and fundamentally different than a Python list. A Python list means something different. Here's what a Python list actually means. It means a collection of items 
that is typically homogeneous in some very loose sense. So typically loosely homogeneous and you usually iterate over it with the for loop and perform the same thing to each element. Think about it. Most of the times when you have a list, right, you have a list of some items, what you're doing with this list mechanically is later on in your code, you're saying for x and x's, do the same thing to each element. It's a core piece of some reporting or some automation. And why I say these are loosely homogeneous is this is not strictly homogeneous. There's floating point values, there's complex values, there's integers, but they're all numbers and I can do the same thing to each element. The reason why you would use this syntax is because this list is mutable, this list might have been cleared out, this list might have had elements appended to it, and irrespective of the size of the list, this code here still works. No elements, it just doesn't loop any times. 20 elements, it loops 20 times. Zero ele or three elements, it loops three times. The code just works. What a tuple is, is a grouping of fields related to a single conceptual entity, i.e. a record. It is typically heterogeneous. And what you typically do with it is you typically unpack it and do different things with each field. And so when you talk about a tuple, you're usually talking about some kind of structure, like a struct in C or C++ or, or a very simple class. For example, if you have a person, you have their first name and their last name. Is that homogeneous? Not really, because you can't do the same things with the first name that you can do with the last name. With the last name, you can put a salutation in the front of it, you can put a title at the front of it and say, dear, Mr., Mrs., Miss, whatever title you want to use. Can't quite do that with the first name, right? With a last name, you can abbreviate with a single and you can say, oh, this is David D. This is Alice A. You don't really do that. You don't say this is A dot Alice. Maybe in some academic context, you might do that, but you typically don't do that. So even though these are strings, they actually mean something different. And if it were the case, that this thing changed the order of the fields, that the last name came here and the first name came here. Like one of our presidents, let's do, who is it? Uh, I keep thinking Steven Tyler, but we'll do Steven Tyler, not a president, but instead a rock star. Steven Tyler is different than Tyler Steven right? These are completely different people. The ordering of that tuple actually has some sort of conceptual semantic meaning. When we look at the list, the ordering of the list is a human ordering. It's an ordering that a human being determines, but that ordering is usually an order in which we process the elements. And it's usually either a, so the ordering connotes the order of processing, and it's usually either do them from the first element to the last element, or maybe in some sort of stack-based order because you can pop from that, you can append and then pop from this thing. But the ordering there is almost always used to say, okay, this is the order in which we wanna process these items, we wanna loop over them. Whereas the ordering in a field is also a human ordering, but it's a very different type of ordering. The ordering connotes what the fields mean. Is this the first name field, is this the last name field? Is this the location? Maybe this is Steven, or maybe this is John Steven who lives in Tyler, Texas. They're all strings, but they mean very different things. And if you switch these around, then you have Tyler Steven, who lives in the city of John, which may or may not be meaningful for your use case. Fundamentally, the reason that the list and the tuple coexist in Python is not just because the tuple's immutability allows you to use it easily as the keys of a dictionary. That's a nice little side effect. It's because they mean very different things. Do you mean a collection of items or do you mean some sort of record? You mean some sort of really basic class where you don't name the fields, you just give them the order. And where immutability doesn't come into this is because if you look at other languages like JavaScript and you look at frameworks in those languages like immutable.js, immutable.js has a record type and a list type. They're both immutable. So there's no question of, oh, one's mutable, one's immutable. They're all immutable, it's called immutable.js. The record type looks very similar and has very similar operations and very similar use cases to our Python tuple. The list type looks very similar to our Python list. There's a fundamental distinction beyond Python between the idea of data that is some sort of collection that you iterate over and do the same thing to and some sort of record where the fields connote what they mean.
and that's how we spell it. This is how we manifest this idea in Python with the tuple type. And on the side, we also can use it in order to be the keys of a dictionary. And if you think about it, it's often the case that when you have the keys of a dictionary in Python, and those keys are tuples, you actually semantically mean them to be lists, but you're forced to use a tuple as a consequence of the unhashability of the list. And so you can see this distinction between these two goes beyond even the way in which we use them. It's a much deeper idea. I once saw a really perfunctory tutorial. It was really terrible. And I was talking about the differences between lists and tuples. And it had this example where they had berries equals a tuple and they were doing things. And I thought this is such a silly example because they're not talking about what these things mean. And so one example we like to do on our intro course is to look at some data here and talk about given just the data, what can we infer about the underlying use case? And so, for example, if I saw data that looked like this, I could make some guesses, reasonable guesses, about what somebody was doing with this data. This is probably something like a grocery list because they're mapping each entity, which is the type of berry, to some quantity. So this is either a grocery list or this is a recipe of some sort. It takes four blackberries, two, two, or two blackberries, four blueberries, and three strawberries to make this dessert. If this is a set, because the set is machine ordered, and so as a human being, we can't guarantee what the ordering is, this then corresponds to some use case where they cared whether something was there or not, but they didn't care about what the corresponding value is, because it's not a dictionary, they didn't care about the ordering. So this might be something like a recipe for a fruit salad. I don't know if you have the same experience with recipes, but I always hate it when they tell you all these steps and then they suddenly say in the next step, they just throw everything together in a bowl and you're like, well, I did these in the order. I thought there was an order associated with it. Well, this would be a recipe where the ordering doesn't matter because you're gonna throw it in a bowl and toss it up anyway. If you had a list, this means that you intend this data to not only have the ability to have duplicates because that is one distinction between your set and your list type, but also that you mean it, you mean for this data to correspond to something that you're gonna iterate over. You're gonna do the same thing to each element and where the ordering only corresponds to some order of processing, and the size of this thing is not fixed. You might have five elements, you might have 10 elements. And so, this might be a recipe for something else. This might be a recipe for a parfait. Because think about it, the order of the elements in the parfait kind of matter, right? You put the blueberries on top, you put the strawberries on the bottom. And my restaurant could have a seven layer parfait, your restaurant could have a four layer parfait, with the one thing which is a zero layer parfait, might only be representable in the, in the sense of, here's the parfait that somebody already ate before they brought it out to you. Now, what would these values in a tuple mean? Well, remember, this isn't the notion that we can have 16 elements or four elements, because usually with the tuple we're unpacking, and the unpacking is gonna fail unless we use the unpacking generalizations. It's typically gonna unfail if we have elements we don't expect. And if the tuple means a record, and it means this field means this, this field means this, this field means this, well, we ought to know how many fields to expect in order to assign meaning to them. And so this corresponds to something that has a fixed number of fields. Those fields are distinct in terms of their meaning. And what could that be? Well, think about a recipe for a pie. Because this could be the filling, this could be the topping, and this could be a little garnish. And a, a blueberry pie with blackberry topping is very different than a blackberry pie with blueberry topping. Garnish, I guess, also makes a difference whether it has that or not, but you can see, even though they're both recipes, they're very different types of recipes. The parfait recipe is, oh, just layer, 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 but I don't care how many layers there are. The pie is, oh, well, the thing you do to the filling is very different than the thing you do to the topping. You bake the filling, and I think you bake the topping, but you put the topping on midway through, but the garnish you put on fresh in those nice little flowery patterns. This is why the tuple exists, in order to convey that meaning. And so why does this matter? Let's go back to pandas. And I know I talk about pandas way too much, but it is often the case that in a pandas data frame, we might have something like this. Here we have some, some economic data, GDP and purchasing power parity for the US and the UK. And we might access a column of this data frame in this fashion, perfectly fine. Notice we're using an in-band encoding to represent two distinct pieces of data. What the metric is, GDP or PPP, and what's, what location this is for, the US or the UK. 
And there could be ambiguity because this could be GDP comma adjusted versus GDP unadjusted, which maybe we don't do anything. There's some sort of adjustment here or PPP in nominal versus real or whatever the case might be or in $2,000 or whatnot. And there's some ambiguity how many fields are there. There's some structure here. There's some information here. We have no ability to unambiguously decode that without some sort of clumsy parsing. And so what we would probably like to do here instead of modeling like that is to model like this with a tuple. We want to use an out-of-band encoding, namely the structure of the Python data type, to, dis to unambiguously represent this means the metric and this level means the location. And then we have the ability to select, give me all the GDP values, or the ability to select, give me all the values for the US. Now, this is going to fail with a slice error, and we'll talk about why that fails, but you can use the generalized lock indexer where you put a colon for the first value. And here you can see, here's all the values for the US. So one of the reasons why this matters is because it leads you to really think about storing your data correctly and storing your data with the appropriate meaning. Do you mean GDP US to just be some opaque identifier? Or do you mean to be some structured identifier? And if you mean it to be some structured identifier, it's probably some sort of record, metric, and location that you want to be able to pull apart. And the other reason why this makes sense is every time I use pandas, I know exactly when a function should take a tuple as its argument or a function should take a list as its argument because the API design of a tool like pandas, which I know I talk about pandas way too much, but it's a really great example of a very large sophisticated tool that a lot of people use and a sophisticated API. Well, the API exactly recapitulates this difference. Any times in the Pandas API where you're looking at something from the notion of being some sort of iterable that you iterate over where it can have arbitrary size and it's more data than it is structure, it's a collection, not a record, it uses a list. And anywhere where they mean some sort of record, they use a tuple. And so here, I can say, give me the GDP for the US and the purchasing power parity for the UK. And I use a list in the outermost because I mean select one or more multiple columns. That's very much a collection idea. And I use a tuple for the inner part because I mean select the columns with this particular structural column information, the PPP and the, and the uh, location. That's why all of this matters.